Hey everyone, so this video is going to have a little bit different content than what we usually show on the show. Doug from SV Seeker thought that it would be interesting and possibly educational for people to get a little bit of an idea of what's going on with the different uh, boat builders on YouTube. So thank you to Doug and we hope you enjoy this one. The mind of a boat builder. This is something that takes tens of thousands of hours to do. They're huge projects and a lot of people before they start are nervous about whether they have the personality of the traits and are willing to make the sacrifices. So take a look at uh, Steve and Alex. They're building Acorn to Arabella and they've passed all those decisions. They're gonna share some of that conversation with you. I'm Alex Kreter. Uh, I was born in Paris, France, and I lived overseas for the first nine years of my life, including Greece before I moved to Maine, and ended up meeting Steve actually in school. So as a profession, don't really have a single profession. I studied photography in college, but never worked in that field. I taught English overseas for a while. I worked a couple odd jobs and could never really figure it out until I'm doing this. So now I'm supposedly either a YouTuber or videographer. I'm not really sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm Steve Dinette. I'm from Granby, Massachusetts, born and raised, and that's actually where we're building the boat. I'm um, fifth generation here on a small farm. Um, let's see, Alex and I, yeah, we met at Unity College in Maine where I studied adventure education leadership. And then after that, I was a backcountry guide out in Yosemite and in New Hampshire. I was a ridge runner patrolling the Appalachian Trail for a little while. Um, then I went and got my master's degree in education from Springfield College. And then the economy tanked. And then I was a roofer, did some construction work. Uh, still did a bit of guiding, trip leading, and then I ended up being the head route setter for a big rock climbing gym, designing all their routes and running their route setting crew. And then I quit that to do part-time tree work and build the boat, and now it's just building the boat. Don't have any. Yeah. We were both trying to figure this question out, and it was kind of a tough question, because like, I, I don't think I have a specific hero. I think I have traits that I admire in people, but I don't. I, there's nobody that I put on that pedestal. I don't know, someone who's just kind and treats other people and living things with respect and dignity. I mean, I think if you don't have that trait, I'm not going to have any respect for you no matter what else you've done. Mm -hmm. um, I think beyond that, just people who have found a passion, found a dream, and Falling gone for it. Do. Yeah. Have a drive for something and a love for something. and. She's uh, Akin Ingrid, was drawn in 1934 by William Akin. 38 feet on deck, 11 foot 4 beam, displaces 25,000 pounds. We have the option between um, catch rig for Bermudan or catch rig for gaff. We're going to go with gaff. Uh, and she's classic plank on frame, so oak backbone, uh, oak steam bent frames. Um, I think we're going to do black locust deck beams, white pine deck. And 90% of the lumber came here from the family property. My great-grandfather planted the uh, spruce tree that's going to be our mainmast. Material has always been wood. Um, <coughs> grew up working with wood. I uh, grew up with, you know, being around the old farms and the old barns and having a full appreciation that somebody went out into the woods and cut these trees down and dragged them out of the woods with oxen or horses and you could see the marks where they swung their axe and their adds and hewed them into beams and stood them upright and then those buildings stood the test of time i mean they're up hundreds of years later you know things have lived in them things have died in them parties have been had in them the the amount of i don't know life that that structure has supported is is incredible and the amount of skill and time and effort that goes into making that structure in the beginning is is also incredible and and wood's a, a living thing. It's it's quirky. Every tree is different. Uh, you got to work with that. And I don't know. I like that challenge. So it was always wood. Um, other than that, I wanted a heavy displacement cruising boat. Wanted something that would go anywhere, anytime. And as I was looking through boats, I kind of realized that picking a boat would be like picking a car to build. If you had every make, model, and manufacturer to choose from. You know, the options are just daunting. So I finally decided that I just needed to pick a designer and go from there. And, you know, Harishoff, Alden, Akin, Bueller, all these names kept coming up. 
And when I went to the Akin website, they touted themselves as uh, yachts for unregimented yachtsmen. <laughs> like that that's, is that's awesome. That's definitely us. <laughs> <ass. laughs> and Akin's whole shtick, whether it was a dinghy or a cruiser or a runabout, you know, motorboat, was that they wanted to build design boats that the amateur home builder could build and that they would be safe and that they would be seaworthy and, you know, they would do the job that they were intended. So they have a pretty sterling reputation for that. So then at that point, I was like, all right, we'll build an Akin. And then I started digging through the plans. And uh, when I came across Ingrid, Akin described her as ableness personified, equal to any situation, the type of boat that you can depend to sail herself in heavy weather. Um, and that was exactly what I was looking for. Something that we're not going to go fast. We're not going to win any races. Sailing around Boston Harbor is going to suck. But if we're offshore in a blow, she'll heave to like a dream. Um, she's simple. If something happens, I can have just some hand tools and a couple planks on board and can fix just about anything in any corner of the world, which is something that's very important to me. Yeah, so. it's basically the perfect adventure boat. I mean, considering our background in you know, rock climbing and all that kind of stuff and what we want to do with her, that I mean it was perfect. Where's the fun in that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> There are, there's a bigger answer to that though. I mean, buying a boat is expensive. Buying a cheap boat is expensive as well because you got to fix it up. And for us, I mean, we had the materials here and we had the time. We didn't have the money to buy a boat. So this was the perfect way of doing it while making money to pay for the build. And I've spent so much of my life working on old houses and old vehicles and old buildings and all sorts of stuff. I am over fixing other people's mistakes. <laughs> I'll fix my own, that's fine, no qualms there. But the thought of having to do a repair and not knowing what glue was used or what bedding compound was used or what the paint was or mm -hmm. any of that kind of stuff, I mean, I know the history of this boat better than anything. I mean, I can tell you what trees gave what parts. Um, so I, I don't know if there's many uh, captains who are gonna know their boat as intimately as we will. Yeah. We, uh, so we, like we said, we started about two years ago, but we started from the base. I mean, we knew that we knew exactly how we wanted to make this project work. And so the videos and the marketing were definitely part of it, but then also making sure that we had all the materials and everything prepped for us to do what we needed to do. So when Steve does something, we do it right. <laughs> so we started from the very basics, you know, cutting down the trees, putting up the boathouse, setting up the lofting floor. And then on my end, you know, getting ready for the videos, setting up YouTube and all those kinds of things. So that started about two years ago, but we were also working full-time jobs at that point. Um, so even when I came back down here, I found a job in the area and we were both working full-time. So it was nights and weekends for the first two years. year and a half, more yeah, or less, because now years. it's two years, no? Yeah. Well, for me, it was two years. Yeah. And so that was working a full 40 hour a week job and then probably another 20 to 40 hours a week or more on the boat project um, whenever we could. And last September, we both just went full time on the project. So we both quit our jobs. And now we've been working, working full time on this job. It is the most work that we have done ever. I mean, I don't think I've had a job where I've worked this much. No, so, yeah, we work seven days a week. <laughs> definitely seven days a week. Except for maybe the occasional rest day after a hard push. <laughs> boat should represent about 10,000 hours worth of work. Cutting trees, building the boathouse, restoring the bandsaw, talking to you. None of that counts towards those hours. <laughs> um, so however long it takes us to tick them, we usually tell folks two to ten years. I'm 33. If the boat's not in the water by the time I'm 40, I'd be pretty cantankerous. Back in boat building. None. Nothing. Nothing. Zero. I've never been on a moving sailboat. So my first real sail was a couple weeks ago, it was last month. My buddy just bought a boat and asked me to sail it from Milford, Connecticut up to Saco, Maine. And I had never done a sailing trip before that. I'd maybe been on a boat, I'd maybe held a tiller. And in, you know, even then, like I was learning how to sail, change sails and take them up, put them down, head into the wind, whatever. But we still don't really know how to sail. Steve's isn't gonna sail until Arabella's built. First boat I sail on will be the one I built. I have been studying about this for a long time now. I have put more time and energy into studying and learning about this than I did earning my bachelor's and my master's combined. Yeah. 
So if you would consider someone studying it for their bachelor's and their master's and getting out and like you would put value on that education, I have spent more time reading, researching, talking to professionals, doing my due diligence than I did earning a master's in education. Learning the boat building is partly like the base of learning the sailing. I mean, we will know the boats so well, probably better than most beginners getting on a boat. Yeah, there'll be no question what line does what, where it goes, how it's <laughs> attached. I mean... <laughs> a lot of people have had an issue with us not knowing how to sail and thinking that we're going to build Arabella and put her right in the water and try to sail across the ocean. And that's not what we're doing. Our plan is going to be to sail up and down the eastern seaboard for however long it takes us to sail, to learn how to sail with friends and whoever wants to come aboard and take the time to feel comfortable with Arabella. And then at that point, then we can go on our adventure. Yeah, we'll just be crew on our boat for a while. Yeah. We don't know, we don't really want to know. It's not part of the project. <laughs> takes what it takes, costs what it costs. Yeah, everything is, you know, it's the price that it is and we find better prices, we find more expensive prices and honestly, I think if we knew exactly how much it was gonna cost, it would be a little daunting. It wouldn't discourage us, but there's no point in knowing the entire price of it. And it's also kind of like saying how much is going to cost you to build your house. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you're going to go and buy top of the line, brand new, everything and contract everything out, yeah, your, your house is going to cost a ton of money. If you're going to go a lot simpler, then it's a lot less money, you know, and then, so it really depends. I think with this point with having Victoria and the diesel and the sales from her and everything else, like shit, we could probably get the boat done and in the water push came to shove for another 10 or 15 grand. Yep. But at the same time, you know, if we have the money to spend, I would rather spend it and, you know, do her due diligence and buy, you know, good quality stuff and new stuff and set the boat up well. But, you know, there's there's a lot of wiggle room in there. You know, we could get her in the mm -hmm. water for 50000 We could get her in the water for 500000 it, it just depends. All through the YouTube videos, all of it through that. Yep. So it would be through, we don't make much off of the YouTube ad revenue, but our biggest source of income is through Patreon. But even then, I mean, we are just barely, I think we're just under what we used to be making working full-time jobs right now. So this is like keeping our heads above water and just about everything we make goes towards the project. Hmm. <laughs> I think that one should be answered with how the project started. Go Both for it. Oh, that's your story, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, oh, boy. So building a big wooden boat, taking it on adventure, preferably around <laughs> the world, has always been in the back of my head. Kind of like, I don't know. Don't know where it came from. Don't know when it got there. But I was a kid that like watched the movie The Goonies. You familiar with that? And there's like One-Eyed Willie's pirate ship, and I just love the pirate ship. Like I just wanted to build and sail the pirate ship. I don't know why. Um, my family would go out up to Maine and vacation, and I'd see the wooden boats, you know, in the harbor and that kind of stuff. And I don't know, there's just something about them. And you know, I had the appreciation for barns and that kind of thing. And I knew that boats were just a whole nother level on top of that. You know, everything was curved. Taking a piece of wood that's curved on six sides and making it mate perfectly with another piece of wood that's curved on all six sides is, I mean, if you can do that, you can do just about anything with woodworking. Um, so that challenge and that kind of appeal that you, once you built that boat, you could get on it and it would take you anywhere you wanted to go. I mean, that kind of, I don't know, just always tickled my fancy. And then several years ago, I was on vacation out in Cape Cod. We had a rainy day, went to a used bookstore and picked up a book called 50 Wooden Boat Plans. And that was the first time I'd ever like really looked at boat plans and the differences between them. And I couldn't put it down. It super much got the gears going. And then after that, I just kind of started picking up more books and filling in the pieces and kind of trying to understand more and more about it. Never with any real intention in mind, just kind of finding it interesting and maybe someday this would be cool too kind of deal. And then at some point, I got to the point where I conceptually understood enough about building a wooden boat that I felt like I could do it. Taking the whole boat as a whole was too daunting. It made my head feel like it wanted to explode. But if I broke it down and was like, all right, I can cut a keel timber. 
All right, I can cut a rabbit. I can hang a plank. I can make a knee. Sure, I could do all of these individual things. And if I can do all of the individual things, then I can do the whole thing. Um, it's just a lot to think about the whole thing. So then I serendipitously acquired a few big tools that I would need. And a friend bought a portable sawmill and said that I could use it. And I was like, I have the knowledge, I have the trees, I have the tools. I, the only thing really stopping me is me, time, and money. And time and money are, are real obstacles, but I think they are overcomable. And so at that point, I sat down a few friends who I knew did not like their jobs and would all love going and sailing. And I was like, look it. Me included. <laughs> if we can figure out the funding, if we can figure out how to do this, I can build it. And I can build it well, and we can go cruise, and we can have a hell of a lot of fun. Um, I'm just going to need some help in figuring out this time and this money thing. And they were all very kind and heard me out, and were like, you're nuts. This was at, well, at the point I was living in Spain at that point, and I had come over to visit family, and I visited Steve on my way there, and he pitched this to me, and I was like, you're insane. Like, there's, there's no way we can pay for this. It's as, this is absolutely not possible. Um, but I think that's still, like, stuck in the back of my mind. I was still thinking about it, and then you kept going. <laughs> yeah, and I was like, well, I'm, I'm not one to be stopped by somebody else telling me they don't think I can do it. So I just kept kind of plugging away at it. And then I think the real catalyst was I turned 30. And I kind of took a little bit of a beat and was like, all right, let's say I'm optimistic and I'm going to make it till 90. I'm a third of the way through it. Like, stop, check in. How's this going? Am I where I want to be? Have I done what I wanted to do? Like, you know, am I happy with the course that I am on? And after much reflection, I realized that, I mean, I always knew I wanted to drop out of high school and move to Alaska and go live off the land, homestead, hunt, fish, trap, do all that kind of stuff. I probably would have done phenomenally well. And everybody told me that I should go to college, I should get an education, it would be a fallback, it would be a safety net, and student loans are the easiest loan in the world to pay back, biggest lie I've ever been told. Um, so I got on that path and I marched it, you know, I did the full shebang, went right through the master's degree, like I taught, I fought through, up through the career ranks in some positions and I turned 30 and I realized that I was saddled with student loan debt. I could afford to stay here on the family homestead because I basically don't pay rent or I could, and I could pay my student loans or I could move somewhere else and pay rent, but not pay my student loans but there's no job in the education field that was gonna allow me to pay rent and pay my student loans. Yeah, not even just education. But. It's not gonna happen. Um, so I kind of realized that, you know, I had done more or less what I was been told. Like, don't get me wrong, I, I did my own thing and I bucked the trends here and there, but I allowed myself to be you know, guided by people that I trusted and had, you know, the best intentions for me. And as far as I was concerned, it led me handcuffed into a box. And I do not like being handcuffed and I do not like being in boxes. So I decided that come hell or high water, for better or for worse, the next 30 years I was going to do it my way. And be damned what anybody told me. And that when I turned 60, we would reevaluate again and see how that 30 went. And if it didn't go well, then I would go back to doing what I was told. And if it did go well, then I was going to keep on my track. And I tell you, it's been three years, and I'm so glad I made that decision. <laughs> so at that point, it wasn't if I'm going to build a boat, it's when I'm going to build a boat, how am I going to build a boat. And at that point, it was, I mean, I'm going to throw myself at this until I die trying. Um, and then my research led me onto YouTube, and that kind of led me into some of the sailing channels. And I found La Vagabond and Delos, and this was ways back. They were not making all that much money. But they kept talking about Patreon, and I went to their Patreon website, and I was like, holy crap, these people are making like $2,000 a video. They're making like four grand a month. You know, there's taxes and everything else that come out of that. But still, they are making enough money that that would allow me to build my boat but I'm technologically illiterate. I, I couldn't make videos. Um, I've been told my entire life that I should be a reality TV star because people would pay to watch me live the crazy life that I live. Um, so at that point, I figured that Alex, with his background in photography and his attention to detail and his more understanding of computers and technology, probably could make the videos. 
So I sent him a text message one evening. I was like, what would you say if I told you I thought we could get paid to build the boat? And like 30 seconds later, he called me. <laughs> At that point, I had, uh, I had moved back to Maine after having lived in Europe for about four or five years. And I was teaching English over there. And I had um, worked in a hostel in the middle of Paris for a year as well. And just in all those jobs, like I wasn't working all that much, but I never had the money to do what I wanted. And I was also saddled in student debt at that point. I ended up actually stopping paying my student loans when I was in Mallorca. I haven't paid my private student loans since then. When I graduated, I, I think I came out with monthly payments of $900 a month. And when I lowered it down to interest only payments, it was $700 a month interest only payments. So I paid those for two years straight. It's like lighting 700 bucks a month do. on fire. I mean, it's not even and helping you. <laughs> doing everything I could to try to figure out how to lower the payments, how to reconsolidate, everything, and they wouldn't work with me. So finally I got to Spain and they told me, um, you know, you have to start paying on the principal. And I was like, I, I don't have any more money. There's no way I can do that. And they kept pushing and I was like, fine. It's either the 700 or nothing. And at this point, I'm done. Like, I'm just not going to pay anymore. So I hadn't been paying on those, and when I moved back to the States, I had terrible credit. I was working another job that I liked. I was working in study abroad organization, but I was working way more than I needed to. And I was stressed out. I was starting to get burnt out, and that's when Steve you know, pitched it to me, and he was like, we can make money doing this. And I was like, tell me more. <laughs> like, I think I'm ready. <laughs> So when he told me about the videos, I studied photography in college and I was like, ah, it can't be that much different. And sure it does, it's very different. It's, it's pretty different, but I knew I could figure it out. <laughs> and so I figured if he can teach us about boat building, I, I can definitely teach myself how to make videos. So I quit my job, moved down here and pushed as hard as I could to figure out what I was doing. All of it. So I literally, I, I'm the only one that works on the videos. So I do all of the shooting, I do all the sound, I do all the video editing. Um, and as you can see from my videos, I have a hard time letting go of detail. <laughs> so I, I basically just video edit, which is why you don't see me working on the boat as much. So I'll come out and, um, you know, help out if you need a second hand or, or if there's something a little bit more complicated that we want two brains going on. But I pretty much spend 85% of my time working on the videos on the yeah. project. Um, and I would say that for the videos, that's probably, depending on the video, between 20 and 60 hours a week. Yeah, I would say each video represents like, so if it's a 20 minute video, um, and the videos are probably one to two hours of work per finished minute. They're getting faster now. I'm getting a little bit better. I'm starting to find some tricks, but it's still, um, I mean, that's why we drop down to a video every other week lately. Part of it is to try to kind of have enough content and try to figure it out and make sure it makes sense. But a lot of it is just that I, I just can't keep up with the work. Yeah. So when I was, before I came back from Europe, I did a trip around Europe and I had bought a Canon 70D for the trip. So I did. I had that DSLR and I figured it does video, why not? Let's see how it is. Um, so I started using that and obviously the internal microphone is not good. So I ended up getting a shotgun mic and I realized that that was totally perfect. It was fine. So I've been using that from there uh, since then and I will supplement with a little bit of GoPro footage. Occasionally I'll use the iPhone, but I don't really like how crisp it is. It just looks funky. So I'll use a Canon 70D with a Rode shotgun mic on it. And then for editing, I basically jumped in head first, feet first, everything first, I guess. And I got Adobe Premiere Pro. So I got the whole Adobe cloud system. And that way I can work with Adobe. I made the, the intro that we have with the parallax effect. I did that. I basically just taught myself all of those and went from scratch. I knew nothing about it when I started. I'd never edited a video, ever. <laughs> I mean, first up, we'll be learning how to sail. So we'll probably do that close to home where we can shake the boat down, go out with a bunch of friends. Um, if we need to work on something or fix something, we're not you know, too far from the yeah. shop. Once we're done with that and Alex and I feel confident and comfortable, I don't know. I, I want wherever the wind takes me to be a literal statement in my life. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, from how we answered the questions previously, part of this project is kind of to escape the lifestyle that we're in. I mean, we don't want to be working full-time jobs. We don't want to be tied to anything else. And so it's basically just whatever we want to do at that moment. So the idea is to go around the world, but whether we do that in one year or 70 years, doesn't really matter. <laughs> and where we go from where, whether it's a straight line or not, we don't really care. We definitely have some spots that we want to hit. I mean, we talked about the fact that we're climbers. We definitely want to hit like the fjords of Norway and- Baffin Island. I'd like to get back to the Mediterranean. Coast of Patagonia. Yeah. I'd like to go up to Northern Japan, spend a winter, get snowed in, go backcountry skiing. Um, I think a lot of it is going to be the not too traveled places. Hmm. I know for me, I gave up a lot to start this. Um, so I was working up in Maine and just before I got on the project, I got a pretty decent job. Like I said, I was working for a study abroad organization and I was, it was the first job that I really had a salary at. Um, and I had just met a girl who I really clicked with and everything was going really well. And I decided to quit the job and do the project and invited her down and it was not her thing and she stayed behind. So I still decided to forge ahead and, and do this. So we gave up a lot to, to do this. And it's also been, like I said, the most work we've ever had to do. So I think pushing through everything and really the mental fortitude and really realizing that this is the best thing that we have ever done. I've had the most fun doing this. Yeah, personally the most difficult. Probably staying working at the climbing gym when I really wanted to be building the boat. I think that first like year and a half, almost two years where the boat project had started and I was at work 40 hours a week and actually getting up and going to work and staying there for the day that was really, really, really hard. Um, after that, I don't know, I mean, there's, there's things that have been ups and downs and challenges and stuff, but uh, I always knew it was gonna be a really long, bumpy, windy road, you know? I mean, so it's all expected. Um, I've said from the very beginning that this project is either going to break us down or is going to make us into the best version of ourselves yet. Uh, and so far, uh, that's held true. We've had some pretty big challenges. Um, but when you go into it kind of with that mindset, you know, they're not, they're just hurdles, they're just obstacles, they're, they're not anything to, to really dwell or worry about. We take volunteers, it's kind of tricky, there's, right now there's not a ton to do for like unskilled labor. Um, so, you know, so folks who want to come help and don't have a lot of carpentry or boat building experience, there's not like a super lot to do right now. As the build goes on and we get more like sanding and painting and all that kind of stuff, there will be more. Once we get closer to stripping Victoria, we'll need a lot of help like stripping paint off, pulling fastenings, all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, at the moment, a lot of the stuff is more attention to one piece. And so, you know, you kind of need the, the one person doing it. They don't, we don't need all that many people. There's been a couple occasions where we needed some help for like, you know, physical labor when we were doing like the milling or things like that. And I think we'll get more of that kind of stuff, like you said, with uh, the sanding and things. But at the moment, there are like different moments where we'll, we'll put out a call to action. Yeah. That said, I mean, if you're like a trained shipwright and I ask yeah. you to cut a rabbit and you're like, yeah, I can cut a compound changing bevel in an oak timber. Like, <laughs> I'll put you to work every day, all day. <laughs> yeah, you know, it just depends. But then getting other help, help on the build. This... This project has been interesting because of what it has brought to us. So for example, when we started this, we had zero opportunities. We knew nobody in the boat world. We didn't even sail. We didn't, we had nothing. And then as the build has gone on, we've had so many connections made and it's been probably one of the coolest parts of the project is who we've met and, you know, the companies that we've talked to and things like that. And the generosity of others is absolutely incredible. Um, so, you know, we've gotten some help from Jamestown Distributors, we've talked to R&W Ropes, we've, I mean, there's been so many people who've just been giving things to us. So this boat is going to have, like, the top of the line for everything, which is amazing, and most of it has just been donations, which is, it's just incredible. The videos. Yeah. The videos have been the hardest amount of work on the project. If we didn't, if we weren't doing the videos, we would have a planked hull right now. 
Oh yeah, no problem. The pace of the build is actually more set by the videos than it is by how much boat building work I can get done. So right now it's also kind of tricky because everything for the boat is a individual unique thing that we kind of need to videotape and document. So yeah. if I'm out in the boathouse working seven days a week, Alex can't be videotaping all of that and editing videos at the same time. And if I'm videoing it, then edit, Alex doesn't know what I have for shots, and they may not be the shots that he wants, and that's its own kettle of fish. Makes it tricky. And if we didn't do the videos, we wouldn't have the money for the build. <laughs> yeah. So it's all it's all tied together. Yeah. Um, but Alex is getting better and faster with the videos, and once we get the backbone stood up, we get into a lot more repetitive things. Yeah. So, for example, putting in floor timbers, you know, there's... 80 frames that need floor timbers. We got to literally put in like 40 frames or have 40 floor timbers. So we can film in detail and talk about doing one of the floor timbers. We can set up the GoPro for the time lapse and I can just go nuts for the next three or four days putting in floor timbers. We don't need to film it. And there's going to be a lot more of that stuff. So when we talk to boat builders and they, you know, talk about how this is the quick, easy part of the build and how we're going to get to all the repetitive stuff and how hard all that is. Like part of me can't wait. Cause yeah. like right now Alex is like, Whoa, dude, you need to like go sharpen some tools. You need to like go get the firewood ready for the fall. You need to like, I need, I need a day or two here. Cause um, an important part of the project for us is also, you know, showing those details and explaining how we're learning all these things. Cause we're learning as we're going. And for us, we look at the videos as something that's, if we had that when we started the build, it, I mean, it would have been incredible. So we kind of want to put something together that somebody else, if they want to start a build, has some sort of a resource to go and look to. Yeah, I mean, books. I mean, there's so much books and, you know, short online videos and all sorts of stuff about wooden boat building. But to my knowledge, there's no video series out there that goes from the trees to the sailing vessel, especially not in a professional boat yard. Yeah. And, you know, whether you learn, you know, we tell you what to do or show you what to do or show you what not to do when we mess up. I mean, it's it's all helping to to put another resource out there for people who, you know, kind of want to follow in our wake. And we're so thankful for the folks who paved the way for us, who wrote the books, who documented their stories. And we're just trying to, to add another avenue to that. Um, so that that to us is really important. And it's worth putting the brakes on here and there now and again. And, you know, if it adds six months or a year to the build, but we put that much better of a resource out there for the world, then fine. It's another six months a year. It's not that big yeah. of a deal. We're in no rush. That's the beauty that we're just, we're hitting everything in little steps and we've already got things more or less figured out to a certain point. So like, we're not worried about where or how we're going to get our sales made. When we get to that point, something will be there and you know, that step will be crossed. There's not, I don't think there's anything in the build right now that we're really worried about. I think one of the biggest ones was getting the lead for the lead keel. That came through. People told us we weren't going to be able to find like a keel timber that's big enough. That came through. Yeah, it's been really fun ticking all the boxes we told were impossible yeah. to tick. <laughs> I don't think there's anything on this project that's going to be too difficult to cross. There's short term things. For example, like we just spent the last three or four days trying to find the bearding line. And I, I mean, we still haven't figured it out, but we decided we're just going to go about it a different way and it comes out anyways. So there's nothing that's it's more really... than one way to skin a cat. Exactly. Well, right now it's just the two of us. And the but... dog. <laughs> yeah, and the dog. <laughs> um, but I, part of our plan too is having this boat is it'll be a permanent vacation spot for all of our friends. So... Wherever we are in the world, if they're like, hey, we helped you on the build, or hey, we miss you guys, we want to come see you, or whatever, and they're like, all you need to do is buy a plane ticket. Buy a plane ticket to the Philippines, we'll meet you there. You can stay on the boat for a week, we'll put you on a plane when you go back. <laughs> and that's a big part of the reason for building the Ingrid. Mm -hmm. um, we could have built a smaller boat that would have sufficed for our needs very well. Um, but the fact that we could have a three person crew and then still have two people come and visit us somewhere and be able to put them up and everybody have a bunk, it was, it was really big. Um, and we really hope that we can help people travel and go see things that they never thought they would see. 
Like I grew up with National Geographic in the house and I love flipping through that and just seeing all this crazy shit this world has to offer. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to go see it. And a lot of it I never really thought I would see. And now we have the ability to go see virtually everything that I wanted to go see. Um, so we keep telling friends and family and folks that give us a hand, like, yeah, where do you want to go? What do you want to see? And when people are like, oh, I want to like see bioluminescence and go swimming off the boat. We're like, dude, we can do that off Cape Cod, like dream bigger, <laughs> like whale sharks, like seahorses, like Amazon. I don't know, something bigger. <laughs> and it would be cool to, I don't know, to help people get there and experience that. And you also, when you travel, it's really hard to go somewhere for a week or two vacation, you just end up hitting the tourist spots and you yeah. don't really get an actual honest to God feel for what that country's like. So for us with the boat, you know, to be able to show up and get a three month visa and to be able to spend three months in a country or longer and like really get to know it and get to know some locals and, you know, and then we can tell people like, yeah, come meet us in the Philippines. We're going to be there for three months and come in the last month. And we will take Love you to all the great places. We will know what restaurants not to go to. We will know what ones to go to. We can take you to all the spots that the tourists don't know about. And we can really show you what India or wherever is like. Um, and I don't know. I think it would be really cool to be able to do. And I think that is something that's important for us, too, is, you know, sharing that kind of stuff with everybody. I, I grew up traveling. Like I said, I was born in France. I lived in Greece for two years. And we moved to Maine. I traveled all around Europe. And... Part of me is like, I haven't really traveled all that far. I've been to, to the U.S. and to Europe and to Canada. So it's not been that amazing, but the amount it has broadened my mind is incredible. And the amount of tolerance that I've gained from that. So part of that is going to be taking people aboard, but I think a lot of that too is going to be through the videos. I think that's important. Oh, yeah. This is the best thing we've ever done. Yeah, of yeah, course. Absolutely. There's no question about it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think at this point, if something catastrophic like that happened, I think the amount of help that would come out of the woodwork would be unreal. So mm -hmm. it took us two years to get to this point. If something catastrophic happened, I think it would take us six months to get back to this point. Yeah. And a lot of that's what we learned. I mean, lofting and pouring the lead keel and all of that took a long time to figure out to do multiple renditions. This time, I would know. We're going to go get an air compressor tank. We're going to go cut off some fiberglass <laughs> sailboats. Like, boom, 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 boom. We're going to go get this thing done. Yeah. Um, yeah. It wouldn't be the same amount of work as we put in up to now. Because we would know exactly what to do. We'd have so much help coming through. And honestly, like, how, how can we get this far and then abandon this? There's no way. It would be the biggest regret of my life. <laughs> I think anybody who has this thought needs to go and do it. I think if you have this on your mind, go and do it. Even if it's not, I mean, I don't think it needs to be build a boat. Whatever you want to do, go do what you want to do. That's what we figured out through this. I mean, life isn't about making enough money or having everything that you want to buy. It's not, it's not the material things. It's doing, it's having the experiences, it's being with the people that you want. And for us, th like we keep saying, this is just hard work. Just go and do it. Stop doing it for somebody else to accomplish their dream. Yeah, I mean, this is a lot of work, but I think it's way easier than working 40 hours a week, 50 weeks a year <laughs> for 30 years for somebody else. In the short term, yeah, maybe it's more work. In the long yeah. term, not even close. And I think really... Humans are an incredible species. We've dominated the world for a reason. And given enough time, given enough drive, uh, we can accomplish anything. We've proven that time and time and time and time and time again. Um, you just got to want it bad enough. Yeah, determination's the, the number one thing. And there's a lot of things that, you know, are going to factor into your success or failure. But I think that that dogmatic determination is, is really the, the only one that truly, truly counts. I mean, you hit your head against the wall hard enough, long enough, sooner or later, you're going to break through or you're going to die trying. And either way, I mean, that's admirable in my book. I don't think there is one. No, it's always changing. Um, but basically we're always working on the project. Everything we do revolves around the project. I'm, yeah, I'm usually up and rolling by 5.30 in the morning, 6 o'clock, the absolute latest. If I'm in bed at 7, like, Alex is usually concerned. Like, why are you sleeping in so late? So I get up in the morning, and uh, in the winter, in the fall, I mean, it's before the sun, well before the sun. In the summer, it's as the sun's coming up. 
Uh, and then I usually spend one to two hours most days answering emails, YouTube comments, Facebook, Instagram. I like make my tea in the morning, sit down at the computer, spend a couple hours trying to hammer most of those out. And then at that time, usually Alex is up, we'll make breakfast, and then it just depends on what needs to be done for the day. But if it's like a boat day, then I'll be in the boathouse by eight. We've got neighbors who are somewhat close and we try to oh. be respectful. <clears throat> I mean, even just whacking on a chisel on a nice calm morning is, you know, that's, the neighbors are gonna hear that. Um, try to be respectful. Try to keep it to like the noisy <laughs> stuff to business hours. Um, and then I'll work until I'm done or the work is done, kind of whichever comes first. Um, I've learned enough in my years on this planet that there's a time in the day when it's time to call it quits. And as I've gotten older, I've gotten better and better about that. I'm just not pushing like, all right, I'm tired. I could finish this today, but the chances of me messing myself up or messing this up are, are too great. It's, uh, it's time to go have a snack, have a beer, take a shower, finish it up tomorrow morning. Um, so it just depends. And some days if it's, you know, mild work, that's seven, eight o'clock at night. If it's really hot and it's really ball busting labor, then I might be calling it quits at two or three. It just, it really depends. Yeah. And then for video, if it's a day where he doesn't really need me out in the boathouse, I'll usually either set up a time lapse for him. Um, and then I'll go and work on whatever video I need to do. And that's usually from immediately after breakfast until at or past dinner time. So I usually, I will put in an eight to 12 to 14 hour day editing videos, um, depending on the push that I need to make for it. Hmm. I think the people that we've met have been the best part of the project so far. Uh, it's been really, really, really amazing. The people who have come and volunteered yeah. have all just been spectacular humans. The connections um, through this project have just been incredible. I mean, talking to you, everybody else that's, that's building a boat, and then talking, going to the wooden boat shows, just everything yeah. connected to it. In every aspect, there's, we have just been meeting so many amazing, incredible humans. And the amount of like help and advice, which, you know, free advice, it, it can be tricky at times, <laughs> but just the amount of psych that people have and how dearly they want to see you succeed and want to help you in that endeavor in one way, shape, or form. I think, I mean, that's what makes this project possible. If it weren't for the kindness of strangers, I don't know if we'd be doing it or be doing it to the degree, to the caliber that we are able to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we were talking to a guy recently and I'm not sure where the story came from. I think it's like a comedy sketch, but Basically, imagine there's this guy who's got like a really crappy car. He's got a long commute on the highway, and the car breaks down all the time. And the guy's found if he sits in the car with the hood up, nobody stops. If he gets out and tries to tinker with the motor, maybe somebody will stop and give him a hand. If he gets out and he starts pushing the car down the highway, somebody will stop and help. Usually more than one person will stop and help. And I think that's it, you know? And if people see you just kind of sitting there, hey, come help me you're probably not going to get it. If they see that crazy bastard pushing the car down the road and they're like, this dude's going to get himself killed. Like somebody <laughs> has to help him. They will stop and help. And I think for us, that's the same thing. Like people have come, they've met us, they've talked to us, they watch the videos and they're like, I have this tool. I have this equipment. Yeah. I have this machinery. I have this thing that would help them dramatically. And I know they're going to do it without it. They're going to break their backs. They're going to spend months just dragging trees out of the woods with a tiny tractor and a homemade winch because that's what they got and that's what they're gonna do. And we my cable skitter's sitting out back and I'm not doing anything with it. And I really don't wanna see these guys die. So here you go, I'm gonna loan you my cable skitter. And and I think that's how everything is. Like no, no big thing has ever been accomplished alone. Nobody has ever accomplished anything alone. The whole like, I'm a self-made person that's a pile of crap. Unless you were born in the middle of the woods and never got assistance from any other human being, you can't claim that. I mean, people built roads, people built the infrastructure, like people taught you how to walk and talk and read and wipe your butt and all of these things. And so at the end of the day, I think if you have something you're passionate about, you know, figure out how to do it, put it out to the world, say, hey, I'm doing this and I would love your help. And if you're not, damn it, I'm going to do it anyways. And people tell you you're crazy. They'll tell you it's impossible. 
But really, at the end of the day, the only thing that can stop you is you. And if you begin, the help will come. I mean, from the get-go, we joked that it was like the movie The Field of Dreams. Like, if we build it, they will come. Like, if we prove that we're building this boat... And I honestly didn't think it would come until we had the backbone of the boat stood up. I figured when we were steam bending frames, people would maybe start to take us seriously and was fully ready to go that far on our own dime, working full-time jobs if we had to. Um, and help came miles before that. Long before that. Way yeah. before we ever thought it would come. As soon as people really saw that that we were swinging for the fences, you know, they, they stepped up and helped out. And I'm sure you've experienced the same thing. Well, thank you for having joined us. And if you want to support uh, Acorn to Arabella, Steve and Alex building that boat, you can purchase a challenge coin. These coins sell for $20 and $15 of that, the proceeds, go to Acorn to Arabella. And so that's one way that you can have something to remind yourself that maybe you want a little of Acorn to Arabella in your life and support them. They've got a long way to go. We're going to enjoy their videos for years and years. So help get them off to a nice start. It says, uh, build, sail, live. Two guys, one crazy dream. Join us for our next video. It'll be Scott Smith building Henry Red, uh, the Sea Dreamer project. See you then.